Welcome to episode 3 of the Breeder Spotlight series from Brothers in Farms. In this episode, we will be chewing the fat with another of the OG Biff breeders, Bellinos. Okay, well, welcome, Bellinos. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you. Good to be here. Okay, first question. Let's kick it off. Um, can you remember winding back these many years? Can you remember what your first smoke was? Yeah, many years. It would, uh, well, it would be an unknown strain at the time. It was actually, I was uh, 15, I believe. Best friend of mine. He used to stay with him a lot. Um, his parents smoked. Um, you know, we copped a, a few roaches here and there from time to time. Um, got uh, busted once we moved on to uh, full J's. His mom would roll uh, full J's and just have them kind of sitting around. Um, yeah. Copped those a few times. That was an interesting conversation with her and my parents. Um, but, you know, that's been <laughs> 20 years ago now. Uh, so she contacted good. your parents. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Stealing her weed. She was actually uh, one of my parents' friends, so it was a interesting conversation to say the least. <laughs> so then, what happened after that? Um, you know, just basically got the riot act, was grounded for a little while, but it never really deterred we just decided it was time for us to find uh, a source elsewhere is really all that that happened there <laughs> um, that kind of led into us having to buy our own weed from then on out and so what was that weed like when you were when you were getting it oh yeah um well probably what you would imagine a, a 15 year old could get <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, CD stemmy, definitely um, nothing I would even come close to touching anymore. Um, but at the time, you know, it was the greatest thing we could come across. You know, we were smoking and enjoying it, being rowdy teenagers, I guess. <laughs> so, what took that jump to kind of growing your own? Um, well, as you can imagine, over 20 years of uh, smoking, you kind of develop a tolerance. Um, and my wife smokes as well, and she's uh, she's kind of a heavy smoker, really. She can uh, smoke most people I know under the table easily. So we were, you know, smoking ounce, ounce and a half a week at $200 an ounce. Did some math, did some research, you know, found that if I could grow it, I could... Um, with the amount of the initial investment, I could get my money back within the first grow just from a couple plants. And, you know, I decided to give it a shot. I spent about six months researching around the internet and Discord and whatnot um, before I decided to make that jump. I started with three plants in a closet, you know, and some burples and all that. So, you know, no matter how much research you do you're bound to make some mistakes um but they finished out had a nice little yield and was hooked from there on out <laughs> so a slight bit of blame goes towards your wife there you're blaming her for <laughs> slightly um yeah slightly i probably could afford my own habit but the two of them <laughs> so what was the the jump from kind of what was the motivation from just kind of growing your own to breeding your own? Um, just being around the group, uh, conversations in discord, um, uh, kind of got hooked up with Baz early on a couple of discords back. Uh, I've known him for a few years now. Um, yeah. and he was releasing his first strains at the time. His, um, he started the white grape and the Dionysus delight Bermuda triangle, all those, um, and he had sent me some, and I was talking to him, you know, about how he got it done. It was just really interesting. It's just, um, 
taking things to the next level. You know, the more I got sucked into the whole homegrown atmosphere, the Discord group, and it, it was just really interested me. And then I had a few strains that I really enjoyed, and, you know, I was thinking, you know, if I could cross some of these, I'd probably, you know, have something even better. So um went down that road, uh, popped some more of Baz's white grapes, uh, found uh, the one I wanted to use for my pollen donor from there. I crossed that with uh, Ripley OG, which I really enjoyed. It has a very nice citrus. It's real fat buds. Uh, I also crossed that with some Bloody Skunk and some White Devil, or it was Dark Devil, which became White Devil. And then uh, I created the F2 of the White Grape with Bowser's permission. Um, and then started the whole tester routine and distributing to the community. And i am just been going since then. Um, carrying things on, uh, helping other breeders get started. Um, awesome. I just really enjoy the whole technical aspect of it and then the community aspect and helping other people get started. So which strains have you got kind of available at the moment on the website that are yours? Right now on the website is the White Grape F2, um, which is uh, has a very like a sour grape gasoline turret profile to it. Um, two main pro, uh, phenos to that. There's a, a shorter, extremely frosty, very, very um, great buzz pheno. And then there's a larger, still very terpy, um, still very strong, but not quite as frosty as the smaller version. And then we also have the White Martian, which... Um, is a very good yielder, makes very fat buds. It's super sticky, super terpy. Um, the most common turp profile for it is a very heavy citrus. Um, every now and then you'll get kind of a skunky, citrusy turp profile on one, but by far the most common is a very heavy citrus. Yeah, I'm growing your white grape at the moment. Um, sorry, white Martian uh, at the moment. Um, and I haven't been able to like my sense of smell is terrible. I'm kind of smoking for years and years, uh, but it's um it's overpowered in my tent because it's on its own, surrounded by grapefruit punch. So I can't quite smell it unless I get up close. And uh, it's super sticky, like really, really sticky. I've been trying to defoliate it, and my hands are like glue afterwards. So I'm kind of looking yeah. forward to kind of curing it out. It's very resinous. It's it's a good plant. So the the one I haven't grown is is your white grape. So what's the smoke like off that? Um, that one uh, typically, um, like I said, it's kind of a sour grape gasoline turp profile. Um, they're typically very indica in the couch laning. Um, very typically smooth. Uh, just an all-around uh, good balance smoke profile so i've seen kind of a lot of people kind of saying it's very 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 strong <laughs> all the people yeah, that have kind of seen growing it mm -hmm. it's it's definitely a heavy hitter so a bit of a sledgehammer so it's hold on to your hats if you're smoking the white grip then yeah, it's definitely not um, the best morning smoke unless you got nothing to do that day. <laughs> I'm currently so, working on the F3 iteration of that, um, doing a, a pheno hunt currently. Um, started with a, a full uh, rooter tray full of seedlings. I've narrowed it down to about eight now. Um, got two main ones I'm keeping my eye on that uh, appear to most likely going to be become the parents for the F3 version. Uh, once that's completed, I'm also going to be working on a, w w which will be called Wicked Liquor, which is going to be a hard liquor Cabernet cross, with the hard liquor being a Cabernet Amble cross done by um, self-named hard liquor. Um, he crossed my Cabernet with a Mandalorian Genetics Amble F6. It came out as a great heavy hitter. 
I'm going to do uh, a back cross on that to the Cabernet with the Wicked Liquor. Introduce some uh, male genetics into make sure that we keep that, you know, genetic nice and strong. We don't want any degradation of the genetics. Uh, so I'm going to introduce some males into that. So that will be a um, an F1 reg auto. Uh, it will be full auto, being as both parents already stabilized full autos. Um, and then I'll work on bringing that up to an F3, at which point I'll probably feminize it. Sounds awesome. It will probably be available at earlier than an F3, but it will only be commercially available as a reg until we get to F3 and then cross it the feminized seeds at that point so for anyone that's kind of listening to this the cabernet is not available is it yet uh it was um, but... no it is highly highly demanded it is a uh, discord favorite among those that were able to get a hold of it it was a very low seed producing at the time um and that is quite a shame um i've had one gallons that have been nine ounces plus um, you know, three or four gallon plants being uh, 12 to 14 ounces. And not only is it a good yielder, but the smoke from it is, I mean, it's definitely the, my favorite smoke that I've ever had. And quite I've heard a, that from several others as well. That's quite a heavy producer as well, isn't it? Like that. Yeah. And um, we've had um, from the group, the people that press rosin have seen 23 to 25% returns on rosin press for it so i mean it's a very good presser it's a very good smooth it's got a very sweet taste to it it's just all around very enjoyable something i'm really looking forward to coming out with the f3 making sure that we get enough to make it commercially available this time so did you um you keep hold of some of those seeds then i take it from that last run Oh, yeah, we definitely try to keep some for strain preservation, especially once you're going down the breeding process. You want to make sure you hold on to something that you can come back to if for some reason the next generation uh, doesn't carry the characteristics that you were looking for. You can go back and feed on again. Awesome. That's good because I know there'll be a lot of people after hearing this will be thinking, yep, I want that cabinet. <laughs> um, we're about... Uh, let's see, we're 20, 20 days into the pheno hunt right now, so uh, within the next five or ten days, I should be um, reversing the pollen donor, and so it'll be another probably 60 days or so. We'll do a very limited test run on this, uh, being it's already in a, you know, established and proven strain. I'll just do... Uh, a few testers just to make sure that it's um, presenting the characteristics that I was breeding for, and then it will become commercially available as F3 feminized seeds. Brilliant. So what are you looking for within testers for that? Um, so you're looking um, for like um, people that can run multiple ones, or are you just looking for threes and fours? Or Well... For this one, because I'm doing such a limited tester run, I'm going to be using already established testers within the group. Uh, yeah. We got Aggie and JSK, which are both great testers. They're very good at um, documenting any changes in the plant, their environment, their feed, taking lots of photos and uploading them, letting us know about smell. Things like that is what we're looking for. Um, typically, when we do testers, we want people that have been around for a while, people that aren't just jumping in to get some free seeds real quick and then yeah. going to disappear. Um, part of the tester agreement is they pay for shipping. We provide seeds. Uh, the actual seeds are free. They just pay for the shipping charges. Um, and then we want um, photos documented, uh, typically at least weekly. And then once they get into flower, we like to see twice a week. And then, you know, just keep us up to date on anything that's happening in the grow. Uh, you know, when you first see different changes in the status, such as when pre-flowers show, when you've gotten, uh, you know, the cotton tops or button tops, depending on what you want to call them. Um, yeah. And then just keep us updated, you know, when you start to, to smell, what kind of terror profiles become an evident. And then finally, you know, what everybody's in there for, the final smoke report. Uh, how long did it take you to harvest? What kind of yield did you get? What terps are you seeing? 
And then the overall effects, um, is it, you know, sleepy bud, is it energetic, is it uh, get your heart racing, you know, all that kind of thing. Stuff we need to be able to develop the description of the strain itself. Uh, which is why I will have limited testers on this Cab F3, because I already have all that information. It's just basically a verification to make sure those traits have carried on to the F3. Sounds awesome. So I know that you, you, you're you only kind of breeding autos, um, which is brilliant, because the, I think the beauty of Brothers in Farms is there's so many people growing different stuff. But you're certainly flying the flag for the autos. I, I spoke to Bucky. Previously, he was definitely a photo man. So, have you have you ever grown photos or interested in uh, it? Yeah, um, speaking of Bucky, the only photo I have ever grown is a Bucky's breath from Bucky, um, <laughs> which is a fantastic plant, fan, a fantastic smoke. It'll definitely knock your on your ass. It's definitely worth pursuing. Uh, I know he. That's one of the projects he's working on is bringing that one back around. Um, yeah. it's mostly just the, the timing and the schedule changes and all that. It just, um, and then with my, all my experience prior being with autos, uh, that photo run just showed me that I am really an auto man. Um, I got nothing but love for people that want to grow photos. I don't, I'm not into the clicky auto versus photos. Yeah. Um, it's just. Uh, I always tell people, you know, find your growth style, and my growth style is definitely with autos. For sure. So have you got any plans in the future to try and create an auto from scratch using Ruderellis? Or is it kind of too much work at the moment, being that there's so many kind of good things to play with? Um there's a lot of good autos out there, and I got a pretty good base just with my own strains. Um, yeah. Being that I'm not a photo guy either, um, it would be hard for me to find a photo that I would be so will wanting to be an auto so bad. I I've, I've definitely have been tempted, to say the least. Um, there are some very nice photos out there. Um, you know, peanut butter breath comes to mind, which there's a lot of crosses actually one of our extremely popular crosses right now yeah um but most likely i'm going to stick with stabilized autos um it's definitely something i won't say that i'll never do it's just it won't be in the near future if i end up doing it okay so for the people kind of it's probably useful that aren't breeding but are growing uh, especially more people who are just kind of getting into it or only have a few grows under their belt. Is your grow method is kind of, could you give us a bit of a talk on that? Is is certainly like starting from scratch like that germination process. How do you germ your seeds to start with? I think everyone's got their own kind of way of doing it. Yeah, um, for the most part, um, well, I started out with the paper towel and I use a, a rubber made, a real small rubber made container. Um, but a lot of people use like DVD cases and stuff, and then just a heat mat. I mean, it's a tried and true method. Just keep the paper towels moist and try to stay in like the 80 to 85 range um, inside the case. Um, you definitely don't want to cook your seeds. Some of those heat mats out there are very good at um, heating your seeds up to the point that they're not going to be viable. So that's one thing you got to watch out for when you're doing that. Um, I've switched to trying to do more of a, like a perpetual grow. You know, I, I don't have time in between my grows. I don't dry in my tent. Um, there's always plants in my tent. So I've switched to using, uh, rooters, uh, like root riot or rotor rooters, things like that. Yeah. Um, and that's basically, I will just drop straight into them, um, water them. They get the same... Uh, water and nutrients as my full-grown flower plants. I use the same um, ratio from start to finish. I use a mega crop at six grams per gallon, um, bud explosion one gram per gallon, and sweet candy one gram per gallon. Uh, from start to finish, uh, I can introduce plants at any time. They get the same thing. Um, you know, some people uh, seem to think that's kind of a Pedal to the metal, extreme methodology, um, but I find that um, the strong plants love it. They'll eat it up. 
It shows explosive growth. Um, I've only had oh, probably three plants stall out on me, and uh, I would just say they were just weren't meant for me to begin with, so they didn't make it. Um, I've had, you know, dozens, maybe even hundreds of plants done that way. And uh, like I said, only about three of them have stalled out. Uh, I've seen people try to jump to like a six grams after they've only been doing two or three, and yeah. it burns the plants. I think that's just from the increased shock. Uh, if you start them out strong, they don't seem to mind it at all. That's really interesting. It's uh, it's definitely a full bore bell to them. <laughs> You know, foot to the floor approach isn't it it's just to kind of gun them off on that but i suppose what you're after is is checking out which one's going to be super robust then i take it right i'm looking for the plants that want those nutrients that are hungry and that are going to use it um so i just basically force feed them and see who prevails <laughs> see who keeps the head above water so just rolling back there a minute because you're using these uh rooting plugs so I take it from there, you're going straight into, what is it you're putting them into? Is it straight into their final pot from there? Oh, uh, yeah. With autos, I always try to go straight to final pot. I, I don't transplant. Um, I The risk to reward doesn't seem to be there. Um, I will let them grow in the little rooter tray for about five to seven days after they actually pop up. So with that and germination time, gives you like 10 to 12 days. So usually yeah. when I'm about... 10 days out from harvest, whenever I figure I'm, you know, the the proverbial two weeks, two more weeks, uh, you often see everywhere. Um, when I'm about in that window, I'll go ahead and start germing my next round. Uh, that way they're already up and established by the time I'm chopping. So there's gives me, you know, a 10 to 12 day head start on my next cycle. Um, and so then you... I'm going in. Good. So you don't have those under an under under a light then, or do you have a separate light for that for that whole ten day germination window, or are these just no. kind of growing in natural light? No, they're in my tent. Right. Okay. Um, so I use I use aqua valves um, and trays. So I actually take the uh, the rooter tray and set it right down into my aqua valve tray. So okay. they're getting the same food. They're in the same condition. Um, so basically, from the time the seed cracks, it's in the same condition it's going to be in and throughout its entire life. I run 24-0, lights 100%, all the way at the top of my tent for the entire grow. So that's a very stabilized, consistent environment that they're in. Um, same water, same newt, same light, everything. The only thing that changes uh, once they're at that 10 to 12-day uh, range, now that that's uh, total, that's only about five to seven days old from pop, I put them into fabric pots um, of ProMix. Uh, I only, typically only recommend either ProMix or Sunshine Advance number four. Whatever you can get in your area, whatever cheaper. They're both fantastic mediums. They're soilless mediums, so they're really able to take advantage of uh, all the newts that I'm forced feeding them. Uh, they go into that. I've settled on two gallons at this point. Um, I've done three gallons and one gallons. Uh, really, with doing the trays and the fabric pots, the roots are able to come out of the pots and into the tray, so they're not getting root bound. Uh, the only reason I've moved up to a two gallon from a one gallon is just as you're getting these larger plants, you know, nine, 10, 12 ounces out of a one gallon pot, they start to become top heavy. So going to a two-gallon gives me a little bit wider base. They're able to uh, support it a little better. I'm not looking for the additional medium. I was just using the larger size pot for support. I'm really kind of glad you said about kind of the light height as well, about just putting the lights at the top there and kind of leaving them there for the whole grow because it's certainly something that crops up with a lot of people. They're starting out yes. they buy an LED panel and they have it like up and down. It, they think, oh, I'll just follow it up. and. Well, there there are some people that will bring the light real close to their plants, but then turn it down. Um, there's other people that kind of get it in the middle and just adjust the light as the plant gets larger. Um, I like to just put it all the way against the top of the tent, 100%. Um, I'm running a 5x5 five five right now with five 240-watt QBs in it. So that's 1,200 watts, and they're 100%. 
all the time, 24-0. And then the plants just grow up to meet them. That does keep the tend to keep the plants shorter, squatter. You know, they don't need to stretch uh, to get light, obviously. The tent's pretty well lit. And and obviously, because when they're small and they start, they're going to be reaching up towards that light. So you, you are going to get a bigger bigger flower, I'm going to guess, than if you were kind of keeping the light low. Because uh, you can see a lot of people, their auto flowers only grow a foot. You know, they're very small plants, whereas some other people, I'm thinking of like examples we've got in the group there, Aggies seems to follow the same method as you. He has his lights right at the top, and they seem yep. to be really always a good height. Yeah, so th basically it's give, letting them do whatever their potential is. It's not forcing them to stretch. Um, autos are... Uh, just cannabis in general. If it has, if it's under a low light condition, it's going to stretch more. It's going to have um, more spaced out nodes, um, and your your buds aren't going to be as tight or well developed. So having the light full bore, they're only going to grow as much as they need to or as much as they want to. They're not going to have that additional stretch trying to find more light. Uh, something you commonly see with people just starting out, they'll have They'll be underlit for their conditions. I always try to tell people, make sure um, you have at least 30 watts per square foot, but I actually recommend more in the 40 to 50 range. Uh, 30 will get it done, but if you're really looking to push your plants, you're going to want to be in the 40 to 50 watts per square foot. And make sure you're looking at true watts. Um, if you're using a burple, um, you're not reading true watts based off of your purchase. No, it's a, it's a common frustration, isn't it? I think when people are starting out, they go and grab a light and it's called a something 1000 or it's got 1000 and a little W at the end, but it's not. <laughs> They're always called 1000s or stuff like yeah, that. They, they? It's called a 1000 watt equivalent. Um, yeah. Most of those lights are only 100 to 150 at best wattage. Um, yeah. So if you're thinking you're you know blasting your plants with 1000 watts and you're really a tenth of that, uh, you're going to see it in the plant. Uh, they're going to be stretched out a lot more. The buds are going to be more airy and spaced out more. So where do you stand on defoliation? Because I know, um, like chatting to Baz, Baz loves defoliating. He's brutal with it. He's whatever. He always kind of said, whatever, whatever you've defoliated, I'll tell you to do some more. <laughs> so I know he loves just um, getting it all out there. But yeah, most of us are pretty pretty aggressive with the defoliating. Um, I'll snip a, a few leaves off here and there through the first three weeks. Um, once they start to hit stretch though, I typically will uh, clean most of the plant. Definitely once you start seeing bud sites develop, you want to get anything that is casting a shade onto that area, uh, which is typically a lot. I mean, you can strip a third, a half of the leaves off of a plant there's definitely people out there that will go through and nearly strip every leaf there is. Um, I'll do a real heavy defold during stretch. Once I get in full on into flower and uh, have some nice buds developing, I'll go through and take all the major fan leaves off. Um, obviously, you want to leave your sugar leaves, things like that, so they can develop the trikes on them. Uh, that trim comes in handy later down the road if you're want to make full use of your your entire grow i think there's there's kind of a misconception there that people will think well photosynthesis i'm going to get all the, the plants only going to get its growth through through these big leaves but the flowers themselves develop on their own with light don't they once they've kind of peeked through that flowering they've started to flower yeah main, your main um your main leaves you just mostly need through your veg period. But like I said, once you start seeing actual bud sites form, you're going to want to start getting light to those bud sites. Um, and then the further along the bud gets, the less leaves you need. And by the time you're full on towards the end of your flower, um, there's very few, if any, major leaves left. The plant really doesn't need them at that point. It's putting all its energy into development bud and not into the growth of the plant um plus at the end of the day it's really going to help you out on your trim yeah for sure <laughs> i don't want to be in that trim jail for too long <laughs> yeah that's true 
So I take it your harvesting period then, uh, because obviously growing so many plants for so long, I'm assuming, yes, you're checking trichomes with, you know, with a loop or whatever, but I take it really, you're just, has my plant started to die yet? Yeah, as far as harvest goes, you really got to wait and let the plant tell you when it's ready. Um, don't go by your, your breeder dates. You'll see those on a lot of plants. Um, we even provide them, um, but that's all really based on the breeder's conditions, the breeder's tent and environment. You got to listen to the plant. Um, I highly recommend getting uh, one of the digital microscopes. You can pick them up on Amazon for $25, $30. They definitely make the process a lot easier. Uh, you can do it with a jeweler's loop. Um, but it's hard. It's a little harder. You don't get as good of a look at the trichomes. And if you're newer, you're going to want to ask people, you know, where you're at and if you're in your harvest window yet. So having one of those digital microscopes, you can take a photo and send it to the group. And we can help help let you know you got two more weeks. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Standard answer. So just going back there a minute, you you saying and it, it is a bugbear of mine it's something that irritates me a little bit is is on every every seed site does it because you have to go on that estimation but about the timeline that you're going to get so they're going to say eight weeks or whatever this will grow in eight weeks it'll give you 500 grams but this is the misconception i think with people that are starting out or buying up seeds or buying things that's that is it's not a lie but that is the breeder's conditions Correct. So that, That's their their medium, their newts, their lights, their tent, their environment. I mean, that's all their conditions. Or it's an overall average of all the testers that they've used. So, you know, you get one tester at 100 days and one tester at 60 days, you got an 80-day average. Um, that doesn't mean that 80 days is an incorrect answer. It's just you can't, it's not the Bible, you can't swear by it. Um you know, you can't be, oh, I'm moving in 85 days. Let me get an 80-day plant, and I'll be good to go. Uh, I definitely wouldn't cut it that close. Um, you could run over to, um, you know, 90 days. You could be done in 70 or 60 days. Um, yeah. But that's just an overall average from the breeder's conditions and or the testers that they've distributed out and the data they've gotten back from that. It's It's definitely not a guarantee for your condition no so what are you generally for your for your own personal kind of smoke is is what are you doing with the with the plant once you've harvested it are you kind of um are you a flower man or are you starting to press in and, um i do have a dab press 10 ton um i love it for when i use it i i don't press a lot but i love having it on hand it's definitely a, a wonderful switch up i am Definitely a flower man. I definitely love the roll jays. Um, my, I let my wife roll them. Um, <laughs> she's quite good at it. Um, we'll, you know, roll up a couple jays. They're usually a gram and a half or so a piece. Um, you know, usually about the size of my pinky. And uh, especially now with the whole COVID situation, when we have people around, everybody gets their own jay. Uh, that's another perk of uh, growing your own it's a little easier to let some go uh, be social with it brothers and farms is a community of breeders growers and like-minded enthusiasts with a passion for cannabis we have members from around the world collaborating to bring you the best cannabis genetics possible. Jump on over to biffbeans.com. So on about kind of sharing uh it's nice to kind of sit about and share a joint um covid permitting these days <laughs> but it's also kind of nice i suppose to kind of share share your stuff and that's what that discord's about uh, and i was kind of thinking about you know like people i've seen grow white grape and um in the channel 
uh, and it looks awesome. So that must be kind of super satisfying for you to see other people kind of growing your strain. Yeah, one of the biggest advantages that Discord offers us is being able to connect people all over the world. You know, we can get in, show off our tent, show off our grows, our harvest. You know, and at the same time, you can ask questions. You can see the different grows from the same strains, people growing under different conditions as you um, get advice on, you know, what light should I get? What uh, fan should I use? Uh, do I have enough airflow? Are my temperatures good? My RH good? You know, we definitely don't mind um, helping out the new guys. Uh, we like to make sure that people coming into the Discord are currently growing or at least have everything ready to start a grow. Uh, we will give advice, but at the same time doing so, we ex we expect that advice to be followed. There's a reason that we're, all, we're suggesting a certain tent or a certain fan, a certain light. Uh, we've, we've made those mistakes. We're trying to you know, help give people a head start. Um, we're a collective group. We get together and uh, see the different experiences that, that we have, and we bring that into our repertoire as far as what we recommend. Uh, people growing in small tents, we might recommend one thing versus people growing in a, a larger space. Um, they have different requirements, and we've seen those types of growth, so we can definitely help out. Uh, and that, and, you know, all of us just love to see, you know, beautiful bud picks people's harvest, things like that. It's a, it's a great share. It's a great um, community aspect to it. I suppose the advantage there of kind of giving advice is, is you're not just giving your own advice. You're giving like a collective of advice of everybody's mistakes. <laughs> it's like, it's not just your right. own. You've got that benefit of yeah, everybody's bought that and it's been a mess or, you know. Yeah, definitely the veterans have been long enough. They've seen uh, the advice given by other people. and so they've seen people being advanced because of following that advice. So then they're able to pass that on to without having to actually experience those pains themselves. Like they still know the right answer and we're able to work as a community to make sure everybody's growing the best possible that they can. Yeah. I, I, I'm kind of, as we're talking, I'm kind of glancing back through the white grape kind of, channel and looking at that kind of stuff and it, it, it's brilliant because like you say you can look at that and see a whole plethora of all of the same plant under slightly different conditions and you get there and certainly like looking back there's a uh, reverend gary wayne church there he's he grew an absolute stonking grow there of white grape it looks fantastic rev is the poster child of exactly what i was just saying um he was coming in on a first grow uh, running biff gear uh, it really knocked it out of the park. And, you know, people are saying, this is your first grow. How could you, have, you know, possibly yeah. have pulled this off? And, you know, he basically said, I just took myself out of the equation, uh, just did what he was told, and followed advice to a T, and it worked out great for him. He had a fantastic harvest and fantastic plants. And, you know, he got to reap the rewards of um, a, a nice yield of some top-tier smoke. They're, they're fabulous plants that he's grown there. It's brilliant. That's getting, I um, suppose that's, that's that rewarding bit for you as well, I suppose. Oh, yeah. It's, um, it's well, it's great promotional material as well. You know, here's, <laughs> here's a tent full of my gear. Uh, this is this guy's first run, and look how fantastic it looks. Anybody can do it, um, which is true. Anybody can do it. You just make sure you have the information available to you. Um, some of the stuff you need to grow is not super cheap. Um, I don't recommend um, cheaping out on things. Um, you know, everything that we recommend is not necessarily going to be the cheapest you can get, but it is going to be the, the best you can get. It's going to benefit you the most. It's going to give you the, the most bang for your money. You know, we're not necessarily going to tell you to go buy the most expensive thing, but um, some things there's just a minimum you're going to need to invest in it. So kind of talking about kind of the breeding process what was the breeding process like for you kind of like you touched on it before but growing out certain lines because you'll say oh yeah i'm going to start pheno hunting this what, what does that mean is that like 10 pots or 20 pots for growing out your plants with autos kind of find what um, you're looking i for? start with a, a tray of rooters uh, which is typically 72 rooters 
Okay. Um, you go through, and usually within the first couple of days, I'll I'll pull out ones that have you know taken too long to pop, or if any of them come up with um, wonky looking leaves or whatnot, a slow growth, things like that, they'll get called pretty quickly. Uh, I usually give them about a week, and I'll go back through and do the same. Um, at that point, they're ready to be potted, uh, so I'll go through and uh, fill my tent up with uh, whatever strain that I have pheno hunting at the time. And yeah. just basically wash and repeat on that process. Um, Any time that I see an undesirable trait, uh, slow growth, uh, anything that I'm not wanting to carry on, then that, that plant, unfortunately, gets um, tossed to the side. Um, once I'm down to enough plants that will actually still fit in my tent, once they're fully grown, I'll stop calling and just focus on uh, picking out the final uh, winner or winners, depending on whether I'm doing a reg seed run or a feminized run. Uh, feminized, you need two females, obviously. Um, yeah. And then I will take those tents and they get, or take those two moved over into the uh, the old love shack, um, <laughs> which is a two by two that I have. Uh, same conditions. It's uh, I have a, a hundred watt QB in there. Uh, still running uh, aqua valve, um, hooked to the same res, so their conditions change very little. Yeah. Um, I'll usually move the one I've decided to use as the the pollen donor first. Um, a lot of times I'll have to trim them down because since I'm only using a two by two, I'll trim them down, lollipop them, uh, take off any any extra width from them, and then I'll go through the reversing process once I have viable pollen sacs. That's when the to be mother uh, goes through the same trim. Uh, she gets slowly popped and trimmed down so that she can fit in there with the male, uh, okay. which is the male at that point, uh, genetically still a female, um, and then lives there um, until the last couple weeks of her life. Make sure that she's exposed to as much pollen as possible. Um, toward the last couple weeks, I'll pull her out, chop down the pollen donor. Uh, spray her down with water to make sure no pollen is going to be transferred once I move her back into the main tent. She gets to move back into the master suite for the last two or three weeks of her life. Um, I'll let her basically uh, die of old age, though, um, okay. not checking trikes. Um, she, anytime you're doing a true seed run, you have decided to forfeit the plant. Um, I'm not watching trikes. I'm not looking for bud development anymore at that point. Everything is about the seeds. Make sure they have plenty of time to mature. Um, looking to make sure we have fully developed seeds from the top to the bottom. Uh, it's all about the seeds at that point. You have to be so, willing to give up the plant. So how do you know your seeds are ready? That's, what, that's the question. Is, is you waiting for them to drop? Um, um, once the plant is, starts to die, um, it's a pretty good indicator. Um, but you can watch the seeds. They'll turn a, a dark color. They typically start getting uh, spots or tiger stripes on them. Um, once they appear to be ready, I'll pull a few and do like a germ test on them, um, make sure they're viable. Um, once I'm getting viable seeds, I'll usually leave them on still at least another 7 to 10 days just to make sure. Okay. And so how do you collect them out? I know it sounds like a small practical question, but a lot of people uh, won't, won't know this. Um, that is uh, the bane of my existence at that time. <laughs> uh, people complain about trim jail. I would I would trade trim jail for uh, de-seeding any day of the week. Um, you know, I'm de-seeding by hand. There are de-seeders out there, but we de-seed by hand. Um, basically, you're going through and um, think about breaking weed up for a joint by hand, um, but at the same time you're doing that, you're squeezing seeds out of the calyxes, um, breaking any extra plant matter off of them that's still adhered to them, like just cleaning them up. You can go through and break it, a lot of it up. If you over-dry the plant during your drying process, it makes it a bit easier. You can kind of crumble, crumble the plant matter, and the seeds will drop out of it. Then just a combination of um, breaking it up by hand and sifting and using an incline tray to separate it out. 
you can use uh, a larger micron sifting can help with that a little bit. Yeah, I think I'm going to stick with trim gel. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not a pleasant experience. It's definitely worse than trim gel. Awesome. So, kind of, once you've got those, do you store those in a particular way, or is there any kind of special thing for that for storing seeds? That you do is it you um, refrigerating them or just potting them up? I suppose no, they're quite fresh, I'm, aren't they? Really. Yeah, they're quite fresh. You want to make sure there's not a, much plant matter. You want to make sure they're nice and dry. You don't want any moisture to start to activate the seeds because if they, they get enough moisture that they're wanting to start to grow and that, then they don't have any moisture, they're basically going to just immediately die and you're going to have non-viable seeds at that point. So you want to make sure that you keep them in, in a nice, uh, dark, cooler environment. You don't want them to be overheated and you definitely don't want them to be in a high humidity environment. Uh, once they're stabilized um, and dry, I put them in, you know, smell proof sealed mylar bags. And then I just keep them in a, a, a dark place that stays cool. And as we distribute them out, uh, we pack them into either uh, seed pods or centrifuge tubes depending yeah. on the vendor and the distributor. Um, and then they go out and make somebody happy. <laughs> so on that kind of, I, I think I'm going to guess the answer to this question because you kind of touched on it earlier, but your favorite strain to date? Oh, it's Cabernet. Um, <laughs> I thought it might a, be. <laughs> that's um, why it's coming into an F3. That's definitely my, um, it's a love project there. It's um, my favorite smoke. It's a great yielder. Um, my favorite strain that's commercially available would definitely be White Martian, um, just mainly because of the terp profile. I really love that citrus. To me, it really just tastes like, um, almost like you're smoking a, a like a, a cutie, like a, like a mandarin orange, or you know, just a small citrusy, sweet taste. I quite enjoy it. It's a good yielder as well, but of yeah. every strain ever, it's definitely Cabernet, and that includes any other strain that I've ever grown. Um, right now, um, as far as other people, the one that I'm really liking is the hard liquor. Um, I've grown um, four of those now, I believe, um, all of them being great yielders. Um, it has cab in it, so it's no surprise. and um, <laughs> it does It does tend to lean towards the cab, profile so that's probably why i'm liking it so much i'm going to incorporate that into a back cross with crab a cab coming up so, so that sounds awesome so i'm uh, that's really got me excited because I, I grow photos uh, sorry autos uh, i'm gonna have a little dabble back into photos again in summer but i'm a predominantly autos man and that sounds fantastic i can't wait to have a go with the cabernet uh, and and the hard liquor as well. I think that'll be uh, yeah. Um, hard bad. liquor. The the user, he's currently um, launching his pheno hunt for the hard liquor F 2s So those should be um, available too. Those will be regs. Um, the same as the wicked liquor will be regs. Uh, that's regular seeds. Um, that m meaning that they could be either male or female. Um, yeah. But that's in order to make sure we keep the genetic diversity. Um, both of us plan to feminize at the F3 point on the, both those projects. Awesome. Sounds fantastic. So is there anybody you'd kind of like to give a little nod to? Is there anybody you're kind of looking at their plants other than hard liquor, obviously, or, well, even hard liquor, but anybody that you're kind of excited watching at the moment in Brothers in Farms? I'm currently watching um, definitely hard liquor. He's the closest to having a drop. Um, Zero owned as far as photos has got some uh, great things in the works as well. He'll um, be having a drop here probably this spring, I believe he said. Um, his plants look great. He's got like angry gorilla, which is a, a hawk angry and gorilla glue combination, um, looking fantastic in the testing phase so far. Um, I know Bucky's looking to circle back and come out with the Bucky's breath again, which was, yeah. like I said, it's the only photo I've ever grown, but 
it's fantastic and it, it gets great reviews from the group throughout that uh that angry gorilla of um zero and uh he put up a picture a couple of days ago of uh of the bud dried of that and it man that looks frosty <laughs> it, it is it looks um almost to the point of ridiculousness of the amount of frost that is on <laughs> yeah. it and uh can't argue with the the, the photos too much it, it definitely is a an awesome looking strain that yeah, people really should be special. looking forward to coming out this spring early summer so something else i was going to ask because i know it's it's something else that you kind of provide to that community of brothers in farms is is a lot of the merch on there for like t-shirts and kind of is is your doing as well isn't it it is um that kind of came about we were offering uh some merchandise through a third party which was uh really letting us down as far as um speed from order to delivery i don't really know the conditions behind that but um Due to a side business that I have, home business, um, I had shirt making materials available as far as a, a vinyl materials. Um, so I took a crack at it and I was able to provide for the community. Um, we've actually uh, went into sublimation printing now as well, which allows for multicolor printing directly onto the fabric. Um, one of the most popular revisions that we have currently for the apparel is a uh, BIF uh, in the fashion of the GIF logo, um, kind of a play on the acronym there, uh, and ties right into our peanut butter breath cross releases. Um, we have a, oh. a the peanut butter breath S1, which is a Japs cut, and then uh, several other crosses that all look fantastic. They get very good reviews. So that ties right into that. People seem to like the 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 peanut butter aspect of that logo. <laughs> yeah. So they're customizable as well. I take it you can kind of ask for. Yeah, we reason. have um, we have shirts that people have previously purchased that people can uh, get the same versions, um, but we are fully customizable. You want to do your own logo. Uh, we had a, a user, Raiku, which uh, uses the Biff ring, but he has a, like a guy throwing a hand grenade with a, a pot leaf on the side of it. It's a very nice logo. Uh, he got that custom made. Um, or if you just want certain colors, if you want the the, the Biff logo, in, uh, we had one gentleman get it in purple. Um, you know, it, really any color you can think of as far as that logo goes. Um, if you want a, a printed um, version, you do have to go with a lighter colored shirt just because uh, it is using sublimation dye, and if you put dye on top of a dark color, it's really hard to see. Um, the most popular color we have is the ash gray, um, but the ash gray, the sports gray, light blues, light reds, yellows, whites, you know, really anything, um, contact me and we work up a plan on what it is you want. And, uh, once we're happy with that, uh, it goes into development and have it out to them as quick as I can. Awesome. Good stuff. Okay, well, thank you very much, Belenos, for taking the time to kind of sit and chat. That's superb. I think I might have to go and uh, and bug Hard Liquor and get him to kind of jump in next, I think. <laughs> oh, I would definitely recommend um, signing up for his testers. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, thanks again, buddy. Thank you, it's been good. Well, it was great to have Bellinos on, uh, talking about his strains. Don't forget to head over to biffbeans.com pick up perhaps uh, his White Martian and anticipatingly wait there for uh, Cabernet. Okay, everyone, and next episode, I think we'll be talking to Hard Liquor.